for this public lecture, Professor Luis Nguyen Cereza, um, who is AC Jordan Chair of African Studies at UCT, as well as the Director of the Center for African Studies. Um, Professor Cereza and I go back a few years. Um, we both, in the past, have been writing on issues concerning land and agrarian transformation. Uh, I stopped. Um, but he continued. <laughs> so, so we're very happy to welcome him this evening uh, at Uhuru. Um, he, I wasn't too sure about the title of his talk, but he said to me, it's Cecil John Rhodes and his legacies. Legacies. Yeah. In the pure, in the plural. Yeah. We don't know what these legacies are that he's going to talk about. But, um, as Cecil John Rhodes is on the agenda these days, and as he's about to fall, as he must, <laughs> I think it's a very topical uh, 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 title, so <coughs> I think we'll just leave it up to you. This is a public lecture, so you are going to talk for as long as you wish uh, within the limits. <laughs> you know, you're not, you know that again, you know. <laughs> Good uh, is it evening? Good evening. Good afternoon. And uh, thanks, uh, Mike, for the invitation. Um, as uh, Mike said, uh, my talk will be on uh, Cecil John Rhodes. Initially, I said uh, that to the Cecil John Rhodes and his legacy. And then, as I was developing my thoughts and writing on my paper, I realized that uh, there are at least two legacies that uh, one can talk about in respect to Rhodes. And, uh, <clears throat> and this is what I'll try and do in this uh, lecture. The, the removal of the statue of Cecil John Rhodes at uh, the University of, South of, <laughs> of Cape Town, <laughs> University of South Africa, was undoubtedly a resounding victory for the Rhodes Must Fall student movement. The, the imposing statue of Cecil John Rhodes <coughs> signified deep rooted links between the University of South Africa and colonialism, or in the words of where my colleague Dave Cooper, who wrote an interesting piece in the Cape Times, I think on the 7th of April, he calls, no, he, he, he talks about the links between UCT, what he calls colonial capitalism. However, there is more to Cecil John Rose than uh, than his statue. He left behind legacies that still haunt us to this day. In this regard, I would strongly disagree with the president of Zimbabwe, Robert <coughs> Mugabe, when on his recent visit to South Africa, said that we should not bother about <coughs> Cecil John Rhodes including his statue. I don't know whether you saw him at him on TV or radio. And uh, where well, he told us that he is not worrying that much about the corpse of Rose and, uh, and his fear you know, that if he exhumed you know, the corpse, then uh, the spirits of Rose you know, might, might haunt, might haunt Zimbabwe. Well, according to him, and I remember, you know, that's how it ended. According to him, he said, ah, my sister George Rose, that's history. I disagree with that, as I hope to show, because I believe that you now Rose is still with us in terms of his legacy. <clears throat> in many ways, discussions during the Rose Must Fall campaign and after the removal of the statue show an awareness on the part of the student movement whom rebellion, I think, it was not just a movement, it was a rebellion, that the statute symbolized something much more substantial. 
there is overwhelming agreement that hard work lies ahead. In an opinion piece on the Sunday Times of 12 April this year, Panipijan, who is now the chairperson of our con convocation, that's our UCT, commented <coughs> on the removal of the state union's terms. Is this victory? For whom? It could well be a pyrrhic one unless steps were taken to look beyond the fate of a monument to a billion of the past, unquote. The term transformation of universities comes up whenever the issue of what the next step after the removal of the statue arises. In this regard, a few key matters are emerging as being at the heart of current debates around transformation. Certainly at UCT, where I come from. First, and this is not necessarily in, in, the, in the order, the order, there are issues around demography at the level of both members of staff, academic staff and students. There are strong views that privileged universities such as UCT, Rhodes and the, and the like must be seen to be admitting black students not only from middle class backgrounds, but also from poor and impoverished communities in the townships and rural areas. <coughs> Linked to the issue of student admissions is the need to recruit and produce more black, particularly women, members of the academic staff at all levels, <coughs> from lecturers to professors. So that's one set of issues that's emerging very clearly. And of course, now the other one is about curriculum reform and, uh, and research priorities. This is, this two, two sides of the same coin, are also sort of coming up as being at the heart of the culture of universities, which many black students, and indeed academic staff members, Ex and workers experience as alienating. Curriculum reform and research geared towards primarily a deeper understanding of Africa and its people are thus seen as priorities in the process of what some refer to as the decolonization of universities in South Africa and beyond. What is the above to do with Susan John Rose? Rose realized the importance of universities in entrenching colonial cultures. He played a significant role in the eventual establishment of universities in South Africa. He is said to have, in quotes, donated land and money in the cause of setting up universities, how he got the land and made money have become part of the discussion. No fully-fledged university had been established at the time of his death in 1902, though. But his legacy is still with us as I speak. Notable is that Rhodes would not have been enthusiastic in making the universities he was supporting accessible to black students. He was indeed a racist and treated blacks with utter contempt and disrespect. As will be clear later in my talk, Rhodes never believed in, in, in equality amongst races. He was an embodiment of white supremacy. His influence showed its ugly features with respect to universities in the racially exclusive policy that was adopted by the South African College, which is the forerunner to UCT, and was in Cape Town in 1915. A Latin professor, 
W. Ritchie recounted the experience in these terms, and I quote, from time to time, one or two colored students have attended, has attended you know, the South African College, and in one case at least, taken a degree with credit. But naturally, with a view to the general interest of the institution, there has never been any great encouragement extended to such students. And it goes on. A rather unusual case occurred this year, 1915, when the son of a native chief applied for admission to the intermediate class after passing the matriculation exam. But after some very friendly negotiation, the applicant saw that it was better on the whole to seek instruction elsewhere. So that's. <laughs> Elsewhere, I suppose, the elsewhere know that you know, this uh, professor was referring to, elsewhere you know, could have been you know, the South African Native Co College, the present day University of Forte, which was formally established in 1916. Forte was established as an exclusive university for blacks. The latter blacks were not seen fit to study with their white counterparts, something that Rhodes would be proud of. <clears throat> Rhodes and his, and his involvement with universities is one aspect of his legacy of championing separate institutions, that is for blacks and whites. In this regard, he paved the way for the apartheid system which would be introduced in 1948, close to half a century after his death. I find it pleasing that this aspect of his legacy is receiving the kind of attention it is getting over the last two months since the rules must fall student-led campaign. I'm also aware, and I saw this on TV yesterday, that this institution, Rhodes University, and this is still the name, is, uh, <coughs> is, no, is also taking up no, some of these issues. And I would like to encourage those involved to assist and hope that the momentum will not be lost. What seems to be lurking in these discussions as far as I can observe, is a focus on another aspect of his legacy, that is the legacy of Cecil John, John Rose, namely his views on how colonialists could resolve land and native questions in what is now South Africa. As will become clear during my talk, Rose has left us with a legacy on these matters that still haunts us more than 21 years since our democracy. I would like to devote the rest of my lecture to this aspect of the legacy. In doing this, I will also be making a case and indeed a plea for the involvement of scholars and students in the struggle to deal a heavy blow to this enduring legacy. Of Rhodes. What is this legacy? By way of background, <clears throat> Cape liberalism led to the introduction of representative government in 1853. This decision entailed that every man, black and white, over the age of 21 years, <clears throat> who was a British subject and who had property in land or a building worth a certain amount or who received prescribed annual salary would be granted the right to vote. These qualified rights were entrenched in the Constitution. This marked the rise, I mean, the rise of an African elite. The annexation of the Transkei in 1894 increased the number of Africans who qualified for the franchise. 
a property qualifi qualification encouraged some Africans, in addition to the educated elite, to invest in property as peasants. Colin Barney writes about the South African peasants, the story of the South African peasants. And, and this you know, sort of uh, qualified them for the, for, for the franchise. <clears throat> Africans who qualified for franchise became targets of white liberal candidates, especially at election times. But it's not just liberals, even members of the Communist Party. They used to go to the trans sky and campaign for votes. In this way, these Africans were not only drawn into politics, but were subjected to the influence of the Cape Liberals and their methods of struggle. In the period before the discovery of minerals and gold in particular, the Cape colonial policy towards Africans residing in rural areas was to create a class of African farmers along similar lines as white farmers. It was very clear from the pronouncements of the magistrates in districts such as Talanga, where I have done most of my research, that they, magistrates representing British colonialism in these areas, were firmly committed to civilizing Africans. Chieftainship, sadly, in the British Cape, was not going to be central <coughs> in the colonial strategy of Rome and inland. <coughs> However, <coughs> by the end of the 19th century, the colonial policy towards Africans had changed. The discovery of minerals and gold in particular in the then Boer controlled South African Republic in 1886 was one of the main reasons for the policy shift. The priorities of colonialists changed from establishing a class of African farmers to converting Africans into wage laborers, working mainly in the mines, in some cases on farms. One of the main figures behind this change was Cecil John Rhodes, who was an arch capitalist and having, <clears throat> and having a keen interest in the mineral industry. He also became the Prime Minister of the Cape and was responsible for the introduction of a crucial piece of legislation that dealt a fatal blow to African aspirations of being farmers along white lines. The law in question was the Glen Gray Act of 1893. One of the aims of the Act was to restrict the land holding of Africans to one plot of a limited size. This would provide a subsistence existence for Africans in rural areas, but limited enough to force male members of African rural families to labor in the mines. Linked to this was a model of rural local government the district council, <clears throat> which effectively established a separate form of government for Africans. It is the issue <coughs> of the African franchise that seems to have been decisive in Rose's <coughs> decision to pilot the Glen Gray Act. As Lacey Noe, who taught you know, in, in the politics department here at this university, as she has shown, white fears of being swamped at the polls by Africans had grown by the 1880s. The Prime Minister at the time, Sprague, had attempted to address white fears by passing the Parliamentary Registration Bill in 1887. This act effectively excluded large numbers of Africans who did not own property on a freehold tenure basis from the franchise. In practice, this meant that tribal, so-called tribal and communal tenure was excluded as a franchise qualification. The biggest blow, though, 
was the introduction of the Clan Crime Act. By declaring that land allocated under individual tenure in terms of this act be deemed for purposes of parliamentary registration to be under communal tenure, holders of land under the Glen Grey Act were automatically cut out of the national voting system. At the same time, the act introduced the district council as compensation for the loss of the franchise, especially by the educated. The council, according to its architect, Cecil John Rhodes, was there as an instrument, in his words, to keep the mind of natives occupied and to employ their minds on simple questions in connection with local affairs. And by these local affairs, he had in mind bridges, roads, education, and planting trees. By advocating the district council as a separate institution for Africans, Rhodes was clearly a champion of segregation rather than assimilation. And this was the case, I mean, the case even in the Cape. His reference to keeping the minds of natives occupied with local affairs as colonial. The use of local rulers to buttress colonial rule has been inherent in the definition of colonialism. Cecil John Rhodes had great visions about what the act could achieve, telling his colleagues <clears throat> in the Cape House of Assembly, and I quote, indeed, you may say this is a native deal for Africa. You are sitting in judgment on Africa." Unquote. Rose thinking showed its influence in the recommendations of the Inter-Colonial Native Affairs Commission, otherwise known as the South African Native Affairs Commission, SANAC, <coughs> established in 1903, a year after the death of Rose, essentially to make recommendations <coughs> sorry, <coughs> towards a uniform native policy in anticipation of the Union of South Africa, the commission emphatically opted for segregation as a permanent mandatory principle of land ownership. This recommendation was the real forerunner of the 1913 Land Act. The adoption of the 1909 Constitution discriminating against Africans in the proposed Union of South Africa in 1910 was yet another blow to the possibility of equal rights between white and black in South Africa, including rights of land holding. <clears throat> but these developments had been coming all, I mean, along since the Great <coughs> Act of 1894, and even before, of course, and consolidated after the establishment of Union in 1910. And of course, now we know about the 1913 Land Act, and what I want to say about this Act was that it apportioned a mere 7%, just over 7% of the land for occupation by Africans. The percentage was, of course, increased in 1936 to 13%, which was largely you know, the situation until 1994, the dawn of our democracy. The bulk of the land outside you know, the 7 13% was in white hands, and the land was divided into large tracts of commercial farms held on a freehold title basis and urban areas. In both these categories of land, Africans did not, did not have any right, any land rights and any land and political rights. Now let's move to the situation now. 
post-1994. Not much has changed since the dawn of our democracy, either at the level of land tenure or in government. In its land reform program, the performance of the ANC-led government has been dismal, which means that overcrowding and congestion in the communal areas are far from being addressed. The recognition of the institution of traditional leadership and the laws that have been promulgated since 1994, which give unprecedented powers to chiefs, illustrate that very little, if anything at all, has changed at the governance level. In many ways, conditions are worsening. One of the challenges that any democratic regime faces in South Africa is how to dismantle the former reserves of understands and integrate them with the rest of South Africa, creating a unitary approach in respect of land tenure and citizenship across the country. The enduring dualism between white commercial agriculture on freehold land and black small-scale poorly resourced farming in the communal areas continue to hamper progress. The starting point, it seems, must be an acknowledgement and recognition that the former reserves, for instance, were established <clears throat> as part of a divide and rule strategy to control the indigenous majority and to advance a racialized form of capitalist development. This was the vision of Cecil John Hills. It is hard to imagine an emancipatory project in South Africa that would not make the dismemberment of the former reserves by instance its priority. Yet, Available evidence shows that the ANC-led government is not committed to dismantling the former Palestinians. On the contrary, there is a perpetuation of this system at both the level of land tenure and governance. As we note in our book, which I edited with Fred Hendricks, who was dean here, and uh, Kirk Hedding in uh, the Department of Sociology, Backlogs in the urban areas, ongoing crises in the former reserves, and the appalling conditions of workers on commercial farms are all closely tied to the land question in South Africa. There are many questions about land, but the fundamental land question remains the unequal division between blacks and whites. Post 1994 plans to deal with the palpable inequality have been spectacularly unsuccessful. Now, as I draw my talk to a close, I would like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, <laughs> don't worry, okay, uh, I would like to invoke uh, Mahmoud Mangdan. And, um, and I would refer you know, to his book, a very influential book, Citizen and Subject, published in 1996, where you know, he sort of he writes about the colonial legacy in Africa. He argues that uh, the legacy of colonialism was reproduced after independence. He notes, however, that no nationalist government was content to reproduce the colonial legacy uncritically. Each government, he affirms, attempted to reform the colonial state, but in doing so, reproduced a part of that legacy, thereby creating its own variant of despotism. His main accusation was that post-colonial states de-racialized 
the colonial state rather than democratized it or democratizing it. <coughs> that to South Africa, which at the time of the publication of the book was two years old. And I suppose you know, at the time you know, when the book was submitted for publication, those of us you know, who are familiar you know, with the publication cycle, the manuscript might have been you know, submitted in 1994 or 1995. <coughs> so it, what it was saying you know, was more like you know, a, a prediction of what you no know, one would expect. Right. With regard to South Africa, man, Danny having strenuously challenged the notion that South Africa is exceptional, warned that, and I quote him, the real import of this, this meaning the South African transition to non-racial rule may turn out to be the fact that it will leave intact the structure of indirect rule. As I said, you know, the book was published in 1996, well before the policies and laws on the former Pakistans were introduced. Looking back more than 21 years after the advent of democracy in South Africa, Mamdana's words strike one as prophetic. The various laws that have so far been introduced, the Communal Land Rights Act of 2003, the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act of 2008, or the Communal Land Rights Act is 2002, and the Communal Land and the, the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act is uh, 2003, ostensibly to address the legacy of colonialism and apartheid in South Africa, have in fact entrenched that legacy. A traditional courts bill was introduced, but withdrawn twice. Assessment of these laws shows more continuity with the apartheid past than it does the radical, the radical departure from that past. In this respect, Mamdana's caution on how the transition in South Africa might turn out speaks volumes, and it would be wise to keep this in mind. So far, democracy for South African citizens residing in the rural areas of the former Pakistans remains a pipe dream, at least at the legislative level. Having said this, I would like to relate developments at the level of policies and law and lawmaking to realities on the ground. Emerging evidence shows that the ANC-led government will encounter enormous problems in implementing its policies and laws affecting rural areas in the former past. I have identified three critical pieces of legislation, Communal Land Rights Act, Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act, and the Traditional Courts Bill. One of these, the Communal Land Rights Act, has, has been declared unconstitutional. The court case was brought about by rural communities in Limbaugh. The other piece, the Traditional Courts Bill, was first introduced in 2008 and withdrawn following heavy protests by civil society organizations. It was reintroduced in 2012 and met with even more concerted opposition, not only from civil society organizations, but rural and urban, or both rural and urban, but from government officials, including the then Minister of Land Affairs, Bulutoward. The prospects of this bill being passed in Parliament and subsequently implemented look very slim. The third piece, the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act, is being implemented 
but is already challenged by rural residents with support from civil society organizations. I've been dealing with a case you know, in the area of research which you know, has gone up to the High Court in Bishop and we have a judgment in our favor. And this case you know, is about um, a headman who was imposed on rural residents in situations where they were used to electing their leaders, which was the case in the Kalanga area. They contested the matter, and the judge of the High Court in Bishop ruled in, in favor of the community. So the point I'm trying to make here is that, yes, Mamdane might be prophetic, might you know, tell us you know, about uh, sort of, you know, the, sort of you know, the fact that uh, you know, we are partner of the African continent and that indirect rule you know, will prevail as it has done in, uh, in many parts you know, of the continent. But you know, I would like you know, to sort of challenge you Norman know, in terms you know, of you know, the implementability of, you know, sort of, uh, of these policies and laws. Certainly in the case of South Africa, what we are experiencing is that you know, there is resistance to these laws and policies. The spirit of Cecil John Rhodes is, contrary to President Mugabe's premature declaration, <laughs> continuing to haunt us. The Rhodes Must Fall Student Led campaign bears testimony to this with respect to matters affecting the university. And I want to emphasize here you know, that these are all you know, internal affairs. These are affairs you know, about what's happening within the university, how it can be transformed, student composition, staff composition, curriculum development, and the like. But it is important for students and academics not to be in looking only but to realize that the legacy of social jungles goes far beyond universities. This is the context for my plea at the beginning for engaged scholarship in the struggle for a thoroughgoing decolonization of society, including universities. Thank you. Thank you.